hopefully we'll do well, right? So my name is Venkat again, my partner in crime, Srivatsa is sitting over there. Uh, if you have questions, we can talk a little later. Um, so I'm assuming everyone is an expert on open flow at this point. You know? <laughs> right. Okay, there you go, he gets started then. So uh, what I'm going to cover today is basically you know, how switching has evolved and how internal to Cisco, uh, how we moved from one generation to another generation, so what are the drivers, uh, technology, how that drove architecture and things like that. And then uh, we'll get into you know, some of these new trends in OpenFlow and P4 and things like that. I'll try to put all those things in perspective. I'm not talking products yet, uh, so, but you can still ask me questions on that if you have anything, right? So let's get going. So how did it all start for me? Okay, there's a layer two switching. Is you know we moved on from hubs and we started doing a Mac VLAN lookups and uh, we started doing layer two switching. The whole uh, and then we had these routers that are separate entities, and the, uh, and then at some point we said you know what why we can't do layer three in the hardware? That's how it all started, right? And so the way we used to do is really keep a router outside, put it next to a switch, something called a router on a stick. There is a trunk, and then you connect multiple you know, VLANs on the trunk, and then you know, control plane is separate from the data plane. Some of these phrases are sounding familiar after 20 years, because it, maybe history repeats itself, right? I didn't do anything. I didn't change the slide, so it's somebody else, I guess. Right? Okay. So, um, and then we are pushing these flows down to the switch. We are pushing flows because you know, there are certain flows that are dropped by in ACL or QoS or something like that, and you need to move that, that thought, that idea, back into the switch, so we are pushing uh, flows down to the switch. And then that was very hard. You couldn't push enough flows into the switch. Switch was fast. Fast those days, uh, the fastest router was 180K PPS, and the switch could do 1.8 million PPS. Then we, you know, that, that's how fast life was at that time, right? So even then, we had difficulty in pushing these flows down to the switch. So the next thought is that why don't we automatically learn these things? Because instead of, so when a packet goes to the router, keep track of it. When it comes back, try to compare with it, push it into the hardware, right? And, and you kind of learn, learn from that. So auto learning was the first improvement in the flow switching in that sense, right? The first attempt worked fairly well. Uh, traffic's, traffic was low, even though it looks, uh, and then typical flows that we used to see those days are maybe 32,000 flows is at the peak of traffic within an enterprise of a decent size. It sounds very small, now things have moved on, right? But it does sound like open flow or some of these SDN terminology that you hear. So you see the life going full circle. So we really have to take some of the learnings from these things and apply to uh, what we want to do today, right? So moving on, right, what, what happened next? How did we kind of move from there to the next step? Flow switching itself as traffic started going up, speed started going up, started becoming a bottleneck. Lots and, and then different kinds of flows started emerging. A lot of small flows started emerging. There are a lot of long flows started emerging, right? The, tra the traffic patterns are changing all the time based on the applications that we are, you know, deploying in the enterprises. So that really forced us to move this router that's outside, the control plane that's outside, into the switch. So we had to really bring it in and then start using internal backplane to really push the flows. Otherwise, things are falling apart at that time. So the, and, and a lot of short-lived flows. So even if you push a flow, by the time you figured that, hey, this is a flow, and push that control back into the switch, even though the router is inside next to the switch, the flow is over by the time you figured. So we're filling up the tables with lots of flows. So that became a big issue at some point, right? So that's when we made this move to FIB or SEP based switching, right? So where you, you, you're using not a flow as a, as a key for your switching and you know, to direct packets, but you're really putting a routing table. You want to use routing for where the packets go, and net flow or the flow table for something else, maybe statistics, quality of service, or whatever else, right? So that became a way, to, these are all uh, the, you know, uh, tested technologies in the sense that you know, there was a problem, you, you know, and you solved it, network is fine, speeds go up, traffic goes up, traffic patterns change, you are forced to react and learn from the field and then take the next step. This is, this is just the evolution of how we have come to where we have come. 
And then as, again, flows are still, you know, growing, even though you are able to route them properly, forward them properly, there's still so many flows that you can't really do anything flow related. Then we had, you know, we started aggregating them because you can't, you know, it, it, ultimately it's a cost, at least in the enterprise. You can't start looking at every flow and look at every bit and byte, right? So you start looking at, hey, you know, these sets of packets, I want to go into this detail. These set of packets, I want to go into more detail. And started using something called flow masks to aggregate bunch of flows. If you have a server, you say, hey, you know what? I want to know, you know, how many packets each client is sending to this specific server. And somewhere else, you may want to go deep and say, you know what? I want to know TCP, UDP, and even application level details. So that's the level of granularity to kind of control the flows and flow details, basically, right? That was the next step. A little bit of background on that, but now I really want to step back and say, you know, how did it evolve? I mean, I don't want to go through the whole evolution in slow motion. It'll take a lot of time. So I'm just going to quickly go through how we have come to today and then way forward a little bit, okay? My opinion on those things, right? And every time we either increase the speeds or the traffic patterns change, there are new problems coming up. Something else has to change. That's many times we wait for solutions for these things a little longer because there's no new technology coming up or you have not built a technology to solve that problem. So internal to switch, if you are a switch designer like me, I'm in Cisco for 20 years and designed you know, lots of switches. So you're always looking for the next technology that, bring, that you bring in that enables a new architecture that solves this problem. So you know, every two, three years we get. Once in a while you are stuck, you are just behind. You have big problems, but you are waiting because some enabler is not happening. You have not invented TCAM yet, let's say. You don't have a TCAM, you know, with software cams or even hardware cams. There's only so much you could push in terms of architecture and performance, right? So all these are all enablers. So I'm going to show you what are the technologies and each technology, how it enabled the architecture to go to the next level. And that in turn solved this traffic or speed or latency or whatever else. Part. So that's the evolution. You can read through it as I speak through. So really we had CAMPs, simple CAMPs for L2. And the TCAMs are the things that really enable layer 3 and layer 4 switching. The width and depth of these TCAMs is, is good enough that you could po put up to layer 4 switching. You could look up to TCP UDP ports, right? A 72-bit or 144-bit TCAM had enough width to kind of get to that, right? And the next biggest problem we had is scaling flows, you know, because you have flows, and from them we moved on to Ceph and NetFlow kind of switching. And there are some failures also in this whole process, by the way. Typically what you see outside is all the successful products. But sometimes you need to know what are the things that blew up on our face internal to Cisco. We don't make a big publicity about it. There is no white paper that you can read about the bar marks on some of our hands, right? You'll be surprised in the middle somewhere, we designed a flow cache. We thought, you know, caching as a technology, right? All processors have memory, L1, L2, L3 kinds of caching. Something similar, why we can't do for networking? There is a bit pattern. If for this bit pattern, I produce this result. Similar bit pattern comes, I should be able to produce the same result. And we also, these are proven technology. Caching is a proven technology, right? And we don't need to convince people, anyone on caching. Do you think caching is good? Everybody will say, yeah, 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 we should do it, right? Uh, the second thing is, uh, uh, the, I mean, it, it, it's all proven. And other proven concept that we don't even need to debate is locality of reference. Typically, if something we are doing, if, if there is a packet, going from one host to another host, very likely that another packet is going to come soon. So if you cache it, it's going to get used. So the idea is that why not put small, small, like you know, $1 or even 99 cents. Marketing likes 99 then a dollar, right? So I have my marketing partner here, right? It's a 99 cent cache on every wire everywhere. And that would cache those one or two, these presidential flow or elephant flow, there are different names for it, right? The flows that have a lot of, uh, you know, meat in it, a lot of uh, traffic that goes through. Imagine one or two such things you could cache, you could just change the performance. Sounds very nice, but these flows go, come and go so fast, identifying them and, you know, making use of those technologies becomes hard. So proven technologies that nobody would debate, I mean, there's not a single guy who would raise a hand and say, I, am, I, I don't agree. And those things, when you put together, won't solve problems either. So, so you really have to take technologies, technology enablers, and drive the architecture. So flow caching is one of those things that you don't see, but I put in dotted lines that's one of 
We built products that blew or that, that's why you didn't see them. But would have had caches all over the place. Everything is a cache, you know. Every wire would have a cache on both ends. You can imagine, right? 99 cents, okay. And, uh, and then eventually we evolved because of the, you know, uh, the scaling and uh, the traffic speeds and whatnot to specialized tables. If you look at a router or a switch, you'll find a layer two table, you will find a layer three table, you'll find a flow table to, to keep track of flow related aspects and a policy table, whether it is QoS or ACL, things like that. So that's where we ended up over 15, 20 years actually, right? Anywhere you see, there's no different architecture. Any you look at a competitor, switcher, router, or anywhere you go, that's where typically you end up with. And but they have become specialized over a period of time to solve small, small problems here and there. Every time a customer asks, oh, I want something, it, a small bell and a whistle gets added. Even though I show four tables, these things have like few thousand bells and whistles hanging. There's no more space to put any more things there without making it complex, right? That's where we are. And there are two major trends that are happening, and that's where we are going to talk about, right? So two things that are happening. The first thing that happened really is the emergence of multi-core, right? You have cheap cores, and that can do lots of things nowadays, right? So the power, the compute is scaling very well nowadays, right? So that's giving a lot of new, it's, it's a new enabler. It enables certain new things to solve some problems that we had before, right? And typically that's where NFE has come into picture. So the moment software guys are building all these things, the ASIC guys get offended, right? Uh, hey, you know, you have a cool software that's flexible. Can I build ASICs? I mean, the talk, uh, there is a still talk, debate is, uh, you know, we're still debating, and then each of us might agree or disagree, but, uh, would, oh, ASIC will go, everything will be software, right? So if you, if you say that to an ASIC guy, they will get offended. So they are putting some tough fight. And we'll see what wins, right? The right ideas win, right architectures win. It's not about how you and me feel sometimes, right? So I, it, there's no technology religion here. If we don't do, somebody else does it. So because of NFE and multi-core, ASIC guys are looking at themselves and saying, hey, you know, what, what would I do? And the guys are pushing the programmable technologies. They're taking an ASIC. Say, what do I do in the ASIC so that I can have the same level of flexibility or 99% equivalent to software, but it is hardware, but it is an ASIC. Not an FPGA, not a network processor. All those technologies have been tried and have their advantages, disadvantages, right? So ASIC guys are pushing these new technologies to protect themselves, protect ourselves, right? Everybody is going to give a tough fight. In between, we skipped, there is a network processors, actually, I know went fast, but network processors emerged really to solve this L4 to L7. They wanted the software, they look like hardware, but something in between happened, that's a network processor. But with that, the clarity that we have, if you look back over the last 20 years is, if you look at a, like a five or six dimensional space, latency, cost, heat, size, speed, you take five or six of your parameters of your choice that are important to you, right? And try to plot them into five-dimensional space. Little difficult to imagine, but think of even a three-dimensional space, right? And see, where is that you can build a product so that it is viable? Because you make it really cool, fast, low latency, but no, nobody pays for it. There are, it has to be a product to succeed. Ideas-wise, we had more cool ideas than anybody can think of. Some, can you imagine flow cache didn't work? I mean, the thing, right? So, so technology and, you know, the innovators are one thing and the product is on the other end of the pipeline, right? So in that sense, so that is the argument right now. That is the debate that is going on right now. How do we, is there a different sweet spot for programmable ASICs? Is there a sweet spot left for ASICs or is it all x86? My personal opinion, we can debate here, we don't have much time here, maybe we have to debate offline, is that ASICs will survive because there is a sweet spot for it. It's not new. It is something that is going on forever. If you could build a custom ASIC, which will always be better than a general purpose programmable thing. There will be some efficiency. At least this ASIC programmer can do 50, squeeze out 15% efficiency more than this general purpose programmer or programming a programmable ASIC, 15%. And that may be enough margin for somebody else to create a market for it. Right? That is enough for us to productize these ideas and solve customers' problems. Right? So that's where it will end up, most likely. But at the same time, there is a tough fight. Right? If you really think of software is so flexible, in, and then software uh, architecture as well as uh, the way it is being built uh, is just moving at tremendous speeds. 
ASIC technologies sometimes are not moving fast. And it, they look like, the, the theory though is like how it, because it's not visible to you, ASIC technologies are not, you can't see them and compare them as, uh, you know, as much as software technologies. There are very few ASIC technology guys, right? How many ASIC programmers who build switches for their living do you know? There'll be four or five guys, literally. I mean, real serious architects. There are 400 are, you know, guys who develop. But if you talk about a software architect, or if you say I'm a Java architect, you find a lot more of them. So they're a lot more visible because the space is much bigger, definitely. So that's why sometimes when the comparison is being made, you will, you know, you will, you, it's, we might make mistakes, right? So I spent a lot of time on it, but I just want you to see where we are heading and really look at. Uh, use these things to, you know, uh, as a uh, as a decision point. How do you decide where you are heading? What, do you bet on hardware? Do you bet on software? What do you think? So the, we have to learn from the 20 years of switching, right? So let's keep moving, right? So a couple of takeaways. So-called nano flows. We had these flows that are, uh, you know, really long, uh, you know, uh, keys with, you know, everything in every bit and byte in it. Didn't go anywhere. We tried it, right? I'm talking about OpenFlow 2.0, like 41 field flows, right? They didn't go anywhere. So you have to really think about it a little bit. And uh, you can do, you do like a FIB or routing table kind of infrastructure below, a distributed uh, intelligence based infrastructure. And doing presidential flows, that means, you know, your traffic lights and traffic is all moving normally the way it does, but because that day some president of some country is visiting, you, you kind of carve out one special path for that one one motorcade, that is a proven technology, that can be done. But using those flows as a basis for the complete network is going to be very difficult. And this is something that we have done enough times and then learned from it, right? And then ASICs have their own sweet spot. Even with network processors, they found their own sweet spot. There is an ASIC sweet spot and there is a sweet spot for software. And you really have to think of where they fit and make those decisions, architectural decisions, right? Even if you are a network designer, you want to bet on, hey, I'm going to put x86 server everywhere and it's all going to change the world. Think a little bit and step back and look at some of these things and that will give you a better insight. You will be able to make a better decision, right? Learning from the past, right? And there are specialized tables. We have come to a point, these tables are solving lots and lots of problems. These three tables or four tables we talked about, L3, L2, uh, a flow table and a policy table and having these few thousand bells around is what we are used to it. Not a single customer would want to go back and say remove all the bells, just give me a small thing. Uh, each bell is solving somebody's problem in some corner of the world somewhere. Right? So going back to something simpler is not going to be easy. So they solve lots and lots of problems. And programmable switches are needed. So I think that is going to happen either to compete as a technology with software only switching or as you know how do you come the, the velocity right software is forcing a, a, a different speed right and that's to, to kind of do you know, match that speed you are forced to go into programmable ASICs right so that, that these these are the really takeaways if you look back right and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, you know some of these newer things that you hear about so you heard of OpenFlow Vondato uh, sounds to me because I've to design NetFlow, I think NetFlow, you know, it feels like NetFlow 1.0, and then uh, it's a single table. And then 1.1, uh, 1.2, 1.3, every few months there is a new extension is being added. Because slowly you are learning, you are, you are, you are kind of going through the same learning curve that we all went through, maybe not openly, at least the switch designers internally we have gone through, right, over 20 years. OpenFlow is kind of in slow motion repeating the last 20 years. And my guess is that you will come back to the same conclusions, right? At, at, at some level, it doesn't matter what I and you think, right? There are some fundamentals that lull even out everything. And whoever does the right thing will win. Or doing the right architecture will survive. Other networks will crash, right? We, we, we all know that. So, and then where are we with that now? Uh, OpenFlow 2.0 has lots of tables. It does solve a lot of problems. But still, a lot of complexity is still there, right? And uh, the latest thing that happened is a month ago, there is a new language being proposed called P4, right? How many of you heard P4 and read the P4 paper? OK, cool, four or five. So that's good. Yeah, that's why I was expecting five people only for this talk. Anybody else is a bonus, right? So <laughs> the real ninja nerds, right? <laughs> this is the talk, exactly. So. 
uh, there's a new language that describes switches. Very early stages. Um, and I'll give you my opinion uh, on some of these things, right? So that's the model. So P4 proposed an abstract model. And that's the model, right? And uh, you can go to p4.org and it's available, so you don't need to look at it. So, there, so it, it, it has a flexible parser, has a bunch of match actions, and there's a packet modification, there are a bunch of queues and uh, whatnot. So that, it's a very simple model, very elegant model, right? But, uh, and then, uh, and there are certain thoughts I have I want to really share, right? So it is a first usable abstraction in my view, in the sense that there is something that I can start using it. It's getting close to, typically as Cisco switches, what we are, routers that we are building. So far, you are talking about some other flows. Bringing this old 15-year-old technology, putting it back with the latest switch is going to be hard. For us, just the protocol work itself is heavy load and didn't, you know, find enough value for that, right? But I think with P4, we are, we are heading in the right direction. We start seeing some usable abstraction. Is it, at, at the same time, it's really basic operations only, right? It's really, really basic. You, can't, you don't even have a, a QoS model in it yet, right? And as you start adding this real usability, right, with, the, with the QoS, security, ACLs, few things, right? We, we use top three or four, five features. As you add these three or four features, the model starts breaking because that model cannot be supported on lots of switches. There are small, small things in that, that, uh, uh, in, in that uh, picture that uh, you will find it hard. And one of the things that's hidden in there is, let's say there is a table, you do a lookup. If there's a packet coming in, you, you do a lookup. Typically, when you do a lookup at that location in the hardware, you don't have the full packet. Typically, you extract few fields and you do a lookup. That's the first thought. The second one is, immediately after the lookup of the table, you, uh, the model suggests that you mo can modify the packet. So you, could, you should be able to change the packet after every table. And there's no switch like that that can do that. There may be one odd guy somewhere. So there are small, there are some minute details on it that will make these kinds of one model to fit on anything that's existing, right? We can force fit and do small, small tricks, but these things don't scale well, right? And so th there are some difficulties with it. But at the same time, it's, it's, a, it's moving in the right direction. Directionally, they're heading somewhere. But we are at a stage where it, you know, it, it doesn't have even, like I said, a QoS, right? And, and then you also want to see whether, see like a company like Cisco or anybody big, you are talking from a small, medium business to a service provider. Each of these uh, boxes that we build, if we, don't you think if we could build just one box from Cisco, that will be cool? We would. Maybe we make three models, extra large, large, and medium, or something like that, right? It's very hard because they address different sweet spots. These markets, this five-dimensional space that we talked about, have very few sweet spots to make products and make a living out of it, right? And, and add enough value. When I say living, add enough value to customers so that somebody is paying for it. No, it's not, uh, you know, I mean, it's a different business model than, hey, it is free and you got to pay with your privacy, right? So that model is something else. I'm not going to go there. That's going to be a big debate, right? But if you're going to, you know, make a, a, a non-privacy based, you know, pay dollars and, and, you know, make a market and solve customers' problem, it's a different model. Then the space is so huge that one architecture, one model would not fit. And even existing flexible programmable ASICs out there, right? Uh, you might have heard of Doppler from Cisco. Uh, Intel is doing some things. And then, uh, you know, uh, there are two or three of these in the existence, right? Each one of them have already something different than the model being proposed. So there are some fundamental issues there still, but directionally it is, right? And, and beyond that, I think, you know, we really want some stable version for a while so that we can stabilize and write a code and push these things out. That becomes very, very important. Otherwise, you have this new something is more programmable, but uh, by the time I program or write code, there is another version. By the time I do something, there is another version is going to be a little harder you know, for anybody to support. And uh, I'm going to throw some comments uh, at you know, how I see where uh, it's going. Uh, there are, uh, so SDN itself, along with the programmable uh, uh, infrastructure that is being proposed or being done, there are, it's still, we are, we are at the last stage. We are living on the edge right now. And then we really need to think through some of these things. And these are the issues that I see that we really need to understand and, uh, and, and take you know, clear um, uh, you know, decisions on you know, how do we go about it, right? 
So when you think of hardware and software, hardware designers have a different culture of quality. Software guys have a different culture of quality. I'm not saying one is good or bad. They come from different worlds altogether. I have designed ASICs, I have designed, I have written Verilog, I have written C, I have written JavaScript, whatever. I have written enough from one end of hardware to another end of software, right? Uh, so, but each team, the, the mindset when you are designing an ASIC is different. The first 10 ASICs that we get back, each of them will cost you a million, 10 of them will cost you 10 million, maybe the first batch, the real hot chips that they really drive in a car and deliver to Cisco, right, uh, in the valley. And they cost a lot. And some of this, the, late, the cutting edge technology, I'm just showing one, and I have one in my pocket, you know, uh, if somebody wants to just see, it's just a piece of hardware. Um, if you want to pass it on, right? That's a Doppler, by the way, you know, you hear about it, somebody wants to see it, you could see it, just a piece of hardware. So, uh, the, the, hard, uh, the, the discipline that goes in because it's going to cost you $10 million is different than a software where you compile, you have, have a problem, you fix bug, and then you reload it, right? And if you're going to bring that and it's a culture. Quality is a culture. Quality is a culture. Quality is not something that you could, hey, you know, this team, I'm going to pay you, you're going to do this, right? So that culture, when we start moving towards software defined, that's something that we really have to pay attention to. Because you, yes, software defining your network has values. I'm not going to debate that. Yeah, you know, I'm going to agree with you. But how you want to do it, you have to think a little bit about it. Right? How, how do you do that, right? Oh, sorry. So, is it an imperative or declarative? You might have heard, hey, do you want to do centralized everything or distributed? Centralized, we have issues that we faced in the past, right? There are distributed knowledge everywhere, and that has certain issues. And manageability versus programmability, yeah, you want to use SDN to manage so that you simplify things, or do you really want to go program it? Do you want your software programmers to go into the guts of the switching ASICs and start modifying them, right? And how secure is it? And uh, do you really want to do that? And the quality and the culture of that is something that we really need to look at, right? And again, I, ultimately what helps is really investing in an architecture, you know, understanding what exactly that you are solving when you are buying a product or something, not looking at three or four checklist items saying I can support ABC, then looking at the architecture and how it evolved, why we are where we are, what all problems have we solved over a period of time to get here? Those are the things that are going to be the key differences. If we don't look at these things and blindly take, hey, this sounds cool, and do it, we have some difficult years going forward. There's a lot of complexity ahead of us over the next two, three years, and then hopefully we all will choose the right architectures, whatever it is, whichever it is, right? And before I end, I want to just say, if you ever bought a 3850 with a solid architecture like Doppler a couple of years ago, because of the architecture, because of the programmability and done the right way, even newer things that come up can be supported. OpenFlow 2.0 that's defined today can be supported in an ASIC that is productized shipped three years ago. And then you know something OpenFlow 3.0 that might come later also can be supported because you you know you solve some fundamental issues at the lowest level, right? Thank you. Medcat, thank you very much. Excellent job, very good.